Aloha. <clears throat> Good morning here in Hawaii, afternoon or evening for those in other places. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. <clears throat> and remember, this is that time of the year where Think Tech looks for help, support, donations so that we can keep doing these difficult conversations to make good trouble. <clears throat> and many of them in different areas. So thank all of you who are willing and able to support in any way you can and motivated to do so. Okay, today we have with us Professor Vernelia Randall, Professor Emerita from the University of Dayton School of Law, and one of the leading experts on race, racism and the law. Ben Davis, who's now teaching at Washington and Lee School of Law, Professor Emeritus from, and Dude Emeritus, as the t-shirt indicates, from University of Toledo School of Law. Hey, David Larson at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law and chair of the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution. Hey, and Jeff Portnoy, one of our leading Hawaii lawyers and scholars on free press, First Amendment rights, and a range of other civil issues and topics. Well, today with this panel of legal expertise, what's going on at the US Supreme Court? Any sense of what's happening there? Okay. Professor Rounder, you wanna start us off? Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> what's going on in, in the Supreme Court is been building for decades. Uh, my oldest son was uh, born in 71, before Roe versus Wade. And uh, I was a single mother, single parent, and had to make the choice about whether to have an abortion or not. And at the time it was illegal. And uh, I can't say that influenced me not to have an abortion, but I didn't have one. Some of my friends do, and I've always been uh, pro-choice that ultimately the final decision has to be in the hands of the woman who is pregnant. But from Roe versus Wade, from, from, the, from, from that, there has not been a year, a decade, where there has been not opposition, there have been cases that have been eating at the way, and the and the and the Republicans have uh, used their ability to get the Supreme Court justice on that would overturn it. Um, I personally think the leak is about, and I'd like to hear other people's opinion. I think the leak is about uh, trying to lock the conservative justices in. The, the liberal justices have no reason to leak back. I mean, because even with protests, the Supreme Court is not really an institution that is open to protests. And, but I think that by leaking it in, they sort of said, they sort of locked people, anything that comes out that's less stringent now, people will think it's because of the leak and people, uh, I think it was done to lock people in. What's other people's opinion? I was, gonna, I was just gonna say that I agree with Professor Randall that, you know, this is really an example of a, of an effectively executed political strategy. And it's really only one part of it. Um, you know, one part of it was to get people on the Supreme Court that would embrace and enforce very conservative views. And shouldn't be any surprise that um, people are voting as we would think they would vote. Um, and this is really in combination with, with concerted efforts to restrict the vote in lots of jurisdictions. It's an overall strategy that unfortunately for people that believe in democracy, it appears to be succeeding. And uh, I think it's really troubling. And you know, at some point, uh, I hope people are energized to, to, to realize that they have to get engaged, they have to vote, and um, they've got to make sure that we have majorities in the power-making institutions. Well, I, I think we're con you know, people are conflating two issues, uh, the abortion issue, which is now front and center, and 
going back 50 years, the justification for Roe versus Wade in the first place. And it has been 50 years of constitutional debate as to whether there's a constitutional right to privacy. And Roe versus Wade was just one of several cases that were um, decided by the court on the basis of a inferred constitutional right to privacy, which does not appear anywhere in the 14th Amendment. And, you know, it's, it's not only Roe versus Wade, but the, uh, in a marriage, gay rights were all decided in favor of those rights by an implied right of privacy. And what this court, at least in the draft opinion, uh, abortion is really the secondary issue. Uh, if you read the draft opinion, it's based upon uh, the conservatives view that there is no federal constitutional right to privacy. And therefore, abortion, as well as several other things we're about ready to get reversed, are gonna relate back to the states. And that's really the issue that I think is being lost. And I understand why, because how emotional abortion rights are. And really, people need to look beyond this because the next thing to fall is going to be gay rights. The next thing to fall is going to be cases dealing with privacy that the court has found in favor of privacy, although cutting away over the last couple of decades. And the Trumpers have now packed a court with six people who don't believe in the right of privacy, and abortion is the first brick to fall. I read the opinion to uh, lay uh, the groundwork for turning back all kinds of, of uh, so-called privacy rights to the state. But it's hard to tell people to look beyond abortion when 50% of the population is going to be directly affected by the abortion. Uh, I, I think that maybe... The, yeah, I, I agree with you on that point, but I don't know that I can say to people, uh, put privacy above abortion. No, no, and I want to make myself clear on this. Clearly, abortion is the hot button issue, and rightfully so. And, you know, it's just going to hopefully rely on 16 or 18 states that are going to allow abortions and encourage people to have abortions uh, the court is not going to criminalize abortion, uh, but I, I think when 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 people look beyond abortion, not that it's not the major issue, they need to be even more concerned, more distressed, more scared about individual liberties, because they're going to see them cut left and right over the next three to five years or longer with this court. And by the way, who might have leaked this? My vote is Clarence Thomas's wife. <laughs> so if I could just jump in, one of the things uh, that uh, I think is really quite amazing reading this is we go back to this discussion of what's tradition, right? You know, I found it amazing that the traditional arguments go back to the Anglo-Saxon and US history pre the 19th amendment, you know, in all the period that women didn't have a meaningful participation on the whole, some places exception, on the whole in any of the legislative decision-making that was done. I'm, and then as second part of it was that, well, technically you could argue it goes all the way to 1965 in the Voting Rights Act, when black women were uh, prior to that disenfranchised from voting. And so, you know, the idea of tradition going back, for, for me, has been this old canard I've always heard of the anti-abortion movement about, because there's a lot of heavy stuff in that tradition that you can pull on to, 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 to do absolutely devastating things. The other thing about the quote unquote, not the word abortion not being in the constitution, you know, I was thinking like, well, you know, those folks in the 1800s, 18th century, and those folks in the 19th century, all those guys, you know, I mean, you know, surprise, you know, they didn't think about it, you know. Uh, and of course, I wrote a piece really upset with all of this, 
uh, that uh, I tried to get published somewhere and they declined to publish it because I guess I'm not doing conventional legal analysis here, but I would just like to say to you that given the fact that women were not participating from 1965 before, essentially uh, all women were not participating in any of that prior uh, common law or other decision-making or legislative decision-making or constitutional decision-making, everything that he talks about prior to 1965 is suspect. The second thing is that on the divisions that have happened since uh, Roe, anybody else remember what happened after Brown? Anybody else remember the segregated academies? Anybody else remember the civil rights movement and all the division, all that? I mean, if you're going to talk about division being an issue, well, you know, you got you, every time you have a right given to somebody, you're going to have that kind of, uh, of, of situation that, that are, and that kind of a rationalization I find appalling. Finally, I would just like to say is that the bottom line of this, it's about people who are poor. They don't give a damn about people who are poor. Women who are rich will get their abortion. They will and get them. Working I, I class heard, women. I, I don't think it's just women who are poor, rich. Working, working class women. Uh, working class yeah. women won't have access to abortion. That's right. So this is just one more of these oligarchical kind of just get to hell with the poor people. You know, folks, I lived in France for 17 years, all right? I know what health care is, all right? Real health care when you're a woman? I know. It's amazing, the the, the, the backwardness that we have. And so with all the, I, I, I've called this the forced pregnancy Alito draft, and I call this sanctimonious barbarity. What we're what you're watching, and I don't care where you stand on it. If you know what real health care is, this is the sanctimonious barbarity. Yes. cruel. I, I heard an but, interesting. I heard an interesting observation. Heard an interesting observation that most Americans uh, support the right to choose when um, it's a case of rape, incest, or when my daughter becomes pregnant. Um, Thank you. I mean, that's you know. That's, I think there's a lot that's of the way it works. A lot of that's truth the way it works. But um, but but you know the poll is deceiving because at least in 26 states the voting population doesn't support the right to an abortion. That's more than half the states and by the time it's over it'll probably be two thirds one third. And I point out the voting population. Right. They have Except voted for their in daughter. Wait, for their daughter. They have voted in legislators who are passing these very strict anti-abortion laws. So when people say 70% of the people support abortion, it's totally misleading because it's based upon population areas like okay. the East Coast and the West Coast. You have but to go I state by state. But let, me, let me finish one more thought. And again, I want to get away from abortion just for a second because I, I think that's, that's the hot button issue. What we're looking at now is a total shift in federalism versus states' rights. We're going back to the 50s. Federalism became the dominant decision for federal courts that allowed all of these things to get passed. Back to states' rights, where this present court is gonna minimize, whether it's administrative rulings, whether it's gonna be privacy issues, they're going to minimize the right of the federal government to, quote, control our lives and are going to say, no, these are issues to be decided by the states. And we know what happened in the middle 1800s. But that's what's happening with this court. So federalism right. is going to be eaten away and we're going back to states' rights for the foreseeable future. Yeah, but if I, I could I just jump in, just one Jeffrey. thing. That is, is Madison's I, double security. Uh, let me say this. Is Madison's double security the rights of the people through separation of powers and federalism? All right, that was his structure. I'm sitting here in Charlottesville, Virginia, having visited his plantation. And the point that always gets missed in this is what if that structure does not protect your rights? I mean, you can play the shell game of federalism or separation of powers, but bottomly, if there's not, the double security does not protect your rights. 
what do you do? Justice Scalia told me I should go into the streets when I, when I, when I raised it with him. And yeah, is can... that what they want? Is that, that we go into the streets about these things? Because can... if they don't protect you, people will will respond. I'm sorry, people will not respond. They will not take this, and there will there will be women who will have abortions. There will be people who will uh, marry people that they love. Uh, these things will happen independent of whatever the superstructure tries to lay on them in this game. And, uh, and you, they're just going to have to deal with it because people will not, sorry to say it like that, just uh, bend over because why? There is that word liberty in the 14th Amendment. That's a word. It's there. It doesn't say life trumps liberty. It says liberty. And that's a pretty ferocious idea for many, many, many people. I'll just say it like that. And I'll, by the way, all those people who vote for those laws and all that, they're all great on it until it's their daughter. I'm sorry. Just like all those people who are anti-gay until they had a family member who was gay. That's the problem with them, is the idea of having a little more empathy for people beyond just the few people around them. Sorry, I'm sorry, excuse me. Yeah, I, I, I believe, you know, I, I agree with Jeffrey's alarm with the idea that this is the beginning of a path and that we really need to be attentive and aware of that, that, uh, that a lot of things could begin falling under the same principled approach, um, whether it's a principle we like or not, it's one that's gonna be embraced. But I also agree with what Professor Randall was saying earlier about um, the importance of, a, of, of recognizing that abortion as a separate issue. And I, I always go back to, to a, one a quote from Ginsburg, um, going back to the Ferguson case that I think sums it up, where she talks about that, um, when you start restricting the ability to choose, it really goes to women's struggle for equality. Yes. She said that women's ability to realize their full potential is intimately connected to their ability to control their reproductive lives. And I think that's something that we just can't lose sight of. Absolutely. It's central. Uh, it's and central. Uh, the, the, uh, the studies all show that for Black women, the legalization of abortion resulted in significant educational and employment results. I mean, it was at the same time that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and other things like that. Uh, and, um, but, but I don't, uh, I think then that you, I think that we have a society that is oppressive and that turning in the streets is not going to change that oppression. I don't know what we'll do. I think that uh, that the police will turn out with their bazookas that they got from the, from the military, with their cannons, with their uh, tanks, and that they will, it'll be done, that it won't. I think the only thing that can turn and I have no hope to this, is the Democrats deciding to play tough, get rid of the filibuster, pack the fucking, oh, excuse me. <laughs> well, pack, you know, pack, you, pack you, you know. Court and, 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 and make some changes instead of incremental, the, the slow incremental change that comes from by design of the Constitution. We don't need slow incremental change now. We need to go back immediately. So, and that's so it, not going to happen. It's, it's all coming down to voting rights. I mean, we, we have to be real. I mean, uh, the only way things are going to get changed is through the ballot box. And then who knows? I mean, as I said, 26 states have elected legislators who have found the majority in their individual states to pass restrictive abortion rights from, you know, the obscene to, you know, something in the middle. And those people were all elected. The question is, is everybody eligible given the opportunity to vote? This is not going to be changed, in my opinion, in the next 20 years by judicial decisions. And it's not going to happen in Congress. Uh, then it's so, not going to happen because it, the states, the, the, the states have gerrymandered 
the, well, the census was was uh, corrupted so that not all black brown native and 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 indigenous people were counted so so we're underrepresented in the count uh the the uh the the state are gerrymandering the thing to wipe out black voices that occurred not that it's very much we're talking about Florida has one or two black people and they are changing so to wipe that out. Uh, they're changing the voting so that yes, the, these state vote legislature voted it in, but they are in they are in power now. And and I don't see how that's going to change in the next 50, 60 years, if at all. Primarily because the Democrats won't fight. Democrats sit back like, I, I lay this problem at Obama's feet. I lay it at Obama's feet because instead of taking the Congress to court for refusal to uh, have hearings on and protect his presidential right to appoint someone, he tried to play nice. And so now we, we end up with all of these different people. The Democrats aren't going to change. Nope, I don't, I agree. And I just wanted to say that when these uh, harsher what, trigger laws go into place, if this does come to being overturned, the people who are going to be prosecuted are going to be black and brown women. Let yeah. us get real. Yeah. That's who's going to be prosecuted. Not white women, black and brown women. Just like, and the system is going to do its same machine that it's always done with regard to that. And you know, Jeff, you went to Selma and you saw, you saw and learned that history. And it's like, that gives you just a sense of just how dark this thing truly is going, going to be. And you know what? There are plenty of people in plenty of states who are fine with that. Not an, and there are plenty of people who are not fine with it, okay? I'm gonna say that. They think it's outrageous, they think it's wrong. But unfortunately, there are plenty of people who don't care if it's not affecting them. And yeah, as long as they can fly their daughter to someplace or go across the border to Cal uh, to uh, Canada, they don't care. They well, don't we said this, this was part of an overall strategy. Um, and, uh, you know, it's being really well implemented and to go what, to what Professor Randall was saying. I think part of the problem is that the Democrats have not been as effective as doing this, as putting in place such a comprehensive strategy to go to each branch of government and uh, to lay out exactly what they need to do to accomplish the goals and then executing it. And for whatever you think, um, the Republicans have been effective doing it and the Democrats have not. Um, they just haven't laid out that strategy and pushed it and stayed with it. Uh, and as a consequence, now we're losing control of all the legislatures and we're seeing, as what Jeffrey said, um, majorities um, embracing uh, restrictive legislation. Well, don't forget you know, the donors, we, Citizen we, United, we and, can and all, where the money's flowing we, too. You know. We can all express our frustrations, but the question is, how can it be fixed? Frustration is not going to fix it. Uh, going into the street is not going to fix it. It can only be fixed in two ways. Political, ballot box, or judicial. And oh, there's the a latter, way. And, and yeah, what, revolution? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, knew. I mean, don't take that off the table. People should be serious. If the faith, if it's not sufficiently, you, you know, the American society is built on revolution. If, we should we, not take that off the table. We, we, we saw evidence of revolution on January 6th. Do we really want to see it again? Well, no matter I would just say it? that, I first of all, people it. are already in the street. Okay? People are already in the street. But that's they're, not going to wait. Wait. I, I'm wait, sorry about this. People are already in the street, and I so think what? on Saturday they're going to be in the streets all over this country. So what? So what? So, that doesn't change anything. It either has to change politically or judicially. And my thought is, well, I like to finish it, is it's not going to happen judicially. 
with the way the federal courts are set up, both at the district level, the circuit level, and now at the Supreme Court. The only way it's going to change, and I understand, Professor Randall, about your, your, your upset view of the Democrats, and I certainly think they've proven to be as about as dysfunctional as any body can possibly be. Just look at yesterday when they couldn't even get Manchin to vote on something that had no chance of passing. So, yes, they're totally dysfunctional. But, it, it, you know, politically, it's the only thing that's going to work. And whether it's a constitutional amendment or some kind of a federal statute like the civil rights statute, it needs leadership. And right now, there isn't any. And the Republicans have taken the lead in November. If you think things are bad now, you wait till November 2nd when they take over probably both branch, both the House and the Senate, and you'll see how bad things will be. Maybe we'll have a revolution. I don't <laughs> think he can work politically. I mean, I'm serious. I don't no, think I, the I, Democrats I... have the political will to do street fighting. No, they're, I, they're, they're compromisers. They like to pull, they call themselves pulling people together from all sides, and they they don't say, wait a minute, there is only one side on this, and we're going to street fight on this. You'd have to show me, that's, I don't see that as politically happening. And what I see happening is people, what's happened for the last 50 years of my life, get out the vote, get out the vote, get out the vote, and then the Democrats Oh, what can we do? Well, uh, we got Manson, we got Sanina, we got Biden. Biden was uh, was uh, voted anti, uh, voted uh, on some uh, limiting abortion right. So the thing is, is that's not a political. That's not a solution. I don't know what else can be done. In our last minute, hey, any final words? Jeff, where can I get, if, if Professor Randall's correct, where can I get my gun? <laughs> well, you can, you can, these days, you can get pretty much anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I'll say is that- We're not if, encouraging if, that. If people go to the street, yes, there will be people killed. Absolutely right. That's one other thing about the United States that seems really always to happen. That when people go to the street, they get killed. And wait, that's wait, the way wait, the wait system for, works. Wait, the other wait, thing wait. is, my hope is overreach. Just watch how overreach is going to go. Because these folks, the thing about them is that when they got that power thing going, they always go too, too, too far. Uh, and I don't know when it's going to happen, uh, but there's going to be overreach. Wait, wait, wait till June when the Supreme Court makes it even easier to get a gun and to carry it out on the street, because that's next. <laughs> My solution is not a, it's a, only a middle, upper middle class solution because not everybody can do it. Get some passports and leave the country. <laughs> I mean, you know what? If you got that as an ability to do, seriously, go so, somewhere else. Thank you all. Another lively, candid discussion. Sorry, we only have a half an hour. We could probably keep going on this. <laughs> Professor Randall, Jeff, David, Ben, thanks so much for joining us. Watchers, listeners, support Think Tap Hawaii. Come back. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with more difficult conversations to hopefully make some good trouble. Take care. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.